This is a production of the Cornell College Physics Department. The image you're looking at shows an electron diffraction pattern created by a beam of electrons passing through a graphite crystal. This pattern shows that electrons possess wave-like properties in addition to particle properties. Today we'll see how waves create diffraction patterns, and you'll be able to make your own measurements of electron diffraction images to confirm the de Broglie relationship between wavelength and momentum. Let's start by looking at a simple 2D wave diffracting through a pair of slits. You can think of these as water waves, although any wave phenomena will act in this manner. A stream of uniform sinusoidal waves approaches a barrier with a pair of slits and emerge from the slits as a series of beams. There are two important length scales in this picture. The wavelength lambda, which is the distance from one wave crest to the next, and the slit separation d. As we'll soon see, there's a definite relationship between the beam angles, lambda and d. For now, you should note that as the wavelength is increased, that the beam angles also increase. This picture shows waves diffracting, but it really doesn't explain how they diffract. Let's start with a calm wave medium and see what happens as the waves approach the slits. As the waves hit the slits, small ripples get pushed through that spread out as circular waves. The two sets of circular waves then pass through each other. In some places, the waves oscillate up and down together, creating a large amplitude wave. This is called constructive interference, and it takes place where you see the strong beams. In other places, the wave from one slit goes up, while the wave from the other slit goes down, and the two waves cancel each other out, resulting in almost no motion at all. This is called destructive interference. Let's switch to an overhead view to better picture the interference phenomenon. We'll color code the crests of the waves emerging from the top slits in blue, and the crest from the bottom slit is red. The places where the red and blue crests meet form a series of magenta spots that move outward as a series of beams. We'll soon show that these beams are shaped like hyperbolas. Let's look at one particular hyperbola, which we'll color code as orange. At every point on this hyperbola, the distance to the bottom slit is one wavelength longer than the distance to the top slit. For instance, you can count 10 blue ripples from the top slit to the black dot, and 11 ripples from the bottom slit. At every point on the hyperbola, there's always one more red ripple than blue ripple. We'll now spend three minutes deriving the relationship between lambda, d, and the beam angles, as well as deriving an equation for the hyperbola. We'll designate the distances from the slits to the hyperbola by the symbols L1 and L2. We've already seen that L2 is longer than L1 by one wavelength, and this relationship is true for every point on the hyperbola. We could derive the formula for the hyperbola and Cartesian coordinates, but we'll use polar coordinates instead because we're interested in the angles of the asymptotes. The law of cosines as applied to the blue triangle relates L1 to R, the radial distance from the origin to the point on the hyperbola, as well as the slit separation D and the angle alpha. We can derive a similar relationship for L2 using the red triangle, except that the relevant angle is the supplement of alpha. We can simplify the algebra using trigonometry. First, we simplify the cosine of the supplement to relate both L1 and L2 to the angle alpha. However, we really want to use the standard polar angle theta rather than the angle alpha, but this isn't too hard to do because alpha and theta are complementary angles. So we can now take our expressions for L1 and L2 and insert them into our equation for constructive interference. Now this is a fairly messy equation with some straightforward but tedious algebra. We can simplify it to derive a simpler relationship between the co polar coordinates r and theta. The end result turns out to be an equation for a hyperbola. You probably won't recognize this equation because most of us only learn the Cartesian equation for a hyperbola. I also haven't written this in standard form because I'm mainly interested in the asymptotic angle. The asymptotes lie on the part of the curve where the distance r is very large. For instance, if you were to set up a typical optical demonstration, r would be on the order of 1 meter, but d and lambda would be on the order of 10 to the minus 6 meters. Thus, the right-hand side of this equation would be on the order of 10 to the minus 24th quartic meters, which is pretty close to zero when compared to the radius r. That means that the term in square brackets on the left-hand side of the equation must also be pretty close to zero. In fact, I'm going to assume that it is exactly equal to zero, which turns out to be an excellent approximation.
Now, if the term in brackets is zero, that means that lambda must be equal to d sine theta, give or take a minus sign. This is in fact exactly the relationship we want. If we know the slit spacing d and we can measure the angle from the center maximum to the first order maximum, we can see that determining the wavelength lambda of our waves, even if we can't directly see the individual waves themselves. By the way, if you want to use the angle between center and second order maximum, you get the same relationship multiplied by two. Two lambda is d sine theta. This relationship is useful because we can use it to determine the wavelength even when we can no longer see the individual ripples in the wave. We'll demonstrate this, but first we're going to change our display to show the intensity of the wave, which is proportional to the square of the amplitude. If we take our virtual camera and pull away, the waves and soon shrink to invisibility, but we can still clearly measure the beam angles. Now let's see what happens to the pattern as we increase the number of slits to three, keeping the same distance d between consecutive slits. The pattern becomes quite complicated near the slits, but as the waves travel outward, they soon resolve themselves into a series of brighter and dimmer beams. Note that the angles of the brightest beams still remain the same as the two slit angles. Now as we increase the number of slits to four, five, six, and seven, we see that the brightest beams still keep the same angle, but the beams become sharper and better defined. If we were to continue increasing the number of slits, we eventually have a series of very sharp, well-defined beams emerging at the same angles as the two slit pattern. If we shoot a laser beam through a series of slits, a series of laser beams emerge. And when we project these beams onto a screen, we see a diffraction pattern consisting of a series of dots. In case you're wondering, the second dimmer line of dots in this picture is due to a reflection off a glass plate. It's essentially a reflection of the first brighter set of dots. So far, we've only looked at waves moving in two dimensions. Things get more complicated when waves can move in 3D. Let's start with light passing through a triangular grid of wires. This is a PASCO grating. The entire device is about five centimeters in diameter. If we zoom in to the maximum resolution of my camera, you can see the triangular array of wires that make up the diffraction grating. The size of the hexagon is only a couple of millimeters in diameter. So let's shoot both red and green laser beams through this grating. The diffraction pattern that forms shares the symmetry of the grating. And if we look only at spots that appear along one of the lines of symmetry, you'll see a regular series of dots. The spacing between these dots is the same that would be formed by a two-dimensional grating of spacing D, where D is the distance between wires. Incidentally, notice the red dots are spaced farther apart than the green dots. That's because red light has a larger wavelength than green light, so the red diffracting angles are larger than the green angles. Now, if we shot a beam of x-rays through a graphite lens, we'd expect to see a diffraction pattern similar to the optical pattern we got using the PASCO wire grid. That's because carbon atoms in graphite are arranged in a hexagonal array. You can see the hexagonal pattern of individual carbon atoms in graphite in these highly magnified scanning tunneling microscope images taken by Cornell College physics major Fio Lin. Even though the hexagonal lattice isn't identical to the triangular lattice we used to scatter the laser beams, the graphite diffraction pattern is quite similar because you can turn the hexagonal lattice into a triangular lattice by extending the carbon-carbon bonds until they merge together. So the orange lines that you see here um, show the extended bonds, and these act uh, much like the triangular array of wires in the PASCO grating. We can use the STM to measure the distance A separating the unit cells in graphite. You might think this distance is equal to the slit separation D, but that's not quite right. Turns out that D is the distance from one orange line to the next, which is smaller than A by a factor of one half the square root of three. Now we could use x-rays with our graphite crystal, but we're going to use our electrons. This is a Sergeant Welsh electron diffraction apparatus. The electrons are shot out of the electron gun at the back of the tube, hit the graphite target in the center of the tube, then diffract, forming a diffraction pattern on the phosphor screen at the front of the tube. Note that this is an old tube with some burned out black spots. We can see what's happening more clearly by looking at a schematic of the tube. The electrons initially act like particles that are accelerated by a voltage applied to the electron gun, then the electrons act like waves as they diffract through the graphite lattice, and finally, the electrons act like particles as they impact the phosphor screen, producing bright spots of light.
We can measure the diffraction angles by measuring the distance from the graphite crystal to the screen by measuring the distance x from the center spot to one of the first order spots. Theta is equal to the arctangent of the ratio x over l. So we can measure x to find the angle theta, and since we know d, we can calculate the electron's wavelength lambda. It's almost time to show you the electron diffraction data, but first let's look at how to analyze the data. You're looking at one of the electron diffraction images, and there are a couple of numbers you need to extract from this image. The first is the voltage used to accelerate the electrons. That number is easy because it's indicated by the red numerals on the lower left hand end of the image. The value we ultimately want to obtain from the voltage is the momentum of the electron, but it takes a few steps to get there. The electron gains energy equal to the voltage, which is big V multiplied by the charge Q of the electron. The form of energy gained by the electron is kinetic energy, which is one half mv squared, where little v is the velocity. So if you know the electron's energy, you can find its velocity. The momentum of the electron is just the mass of the electron multiplied by its velocity. Note that in this part of the measurement, we're treating the electron like a classical particle. So the next thing we want to do is to measure the wavelength. And um, this is a bit more complicated. First, you need to measure the displacement x at the first order spot from the center spot. Unfortunately, the center spot is missing because, well, there wasn't any phosphor at that point on the screen. However, you can still measure the distance x because of the symmetry of the hexagonal diffraction pattern. The distance between any pair of adjacent first order spots is still equal to the distance x. The grid lines shown on the screen are separated by one centimeter, so that should serve as your ruler. The wavelength lambda is equal to d sine theta, where theta is the first order diffraction angle. We have already seen that since the tangent of the theta is equal to the spot separation x divided by the distance l between the graphite and phosphor screen. For the Sargent Welsh tube, the distance l is measured to be 17.34 centimeters. We also need the value of d, which is the distance from one orange line to the next. This is equal to the distance a multiplied by one half square root of three. The distance a is formally known as the unit cell separation, and you can also look at the scanning electron microscope to figure this one out. Um, you'll be able to see that there are about 16 atoms in a vertical row over a distance of four nanometers. This means that the distance from one unit cell to the next is about 0.25 nanometers, which is actually pretty close to the accepted value. Note that in this part of the measurement, we're treating the electron like a classical wave, which is kind of weird. So it's time for you to freeze frame this video and make measurements of the electron diffraction data. Use about a half dozen to a dozen different values. You'll need both the momentum value, where the electron acts like a particle, and the wavelength value, where the electron acts like a wave. In case you're wondering, here's a simple explanation of when to use the wave and particle models of the electron. If the electron is exchanging energy with something else, use the particle model. If the electron is moving through space, use the wave model. When we use the electron gun to transfer energy to the electron, we use the particle model to find the electron's momentum. When the electron interacts with the graphite, the electron's energy doesn't change very much, and we use the wave model to find the angles of deflection. Note that this explanation of electron behavior is somewhat simplified. Uh, for example, electrons and transistors can act like waves and transfer energy at the same time. However, this concept of energy transfer gives you some idea of when you should use the wave and particle models for the electron. So when you get done with analyzing all your data, you should plot it. And uh, what you're about to see is what I get when I plot all my data. So I've measured the wavelength and momentum for about a dozen of the preceding pictures. I took the log of both lambda and the p, the momentum. A plot shows that the data fall on a straight line. About 100 years ago, Louis de Broglie speculated that the relationship between the wavelength and the momentum was a simple one. The wavelength is equal to Planck's constant h divided by momentum. We can express this as a power law by writing the reciprocal of the momentum as a power. Then, by taking the log of both sides, the product turns into a sum, and the negative power turns the plus into a minus sign. Now, if you look at my graph, you'll notice that the x-axis is the log of the momentum, the y-axis is the log of wavelength, and that this curve is fit by a straight line with slope minus 1 and an offset, which I'll call b.
The best fit of B to these data is minus 33.183. Now the value of B is directly related to Planck's constant. By comparing the linear equation with the log of de Broglie's equation, we can deduce that B is the log of H. Raising uh, 10 to the power of B gives us our measured value of Planck's constant. And this agrees with the accepted value to within 1%. Now the measurements of voltage were only accurate to about 1%. The measurements of distance are really only accurate to about 1%. So it isn't surprising my final result is about 1% off. Nonetheless, these data clearly support de Broglie's hypothesis. The electrons have a wavelength. The wavelength is inversely proportional to the momentum and the constant proportionality is Planck's constant. Now you should make your own measurements and check to see if they also agree with de Broglie's equation. Thanks for watching.